Hello lovely people, my name is Carrie and this is Vintage Soup. Today we'll be taking another sneaky wee peek at a piece of Weimar cinema. And this week the internet has been all abuzz um, about the Joker with Joaquin Phoenix. To commemorate this, I thought I would go back nearly a century to one of cinema's first supervillains. So in this video, we are going to have a wee look at Dr. Mabusa Gerspieler, made in 1922, directed by Fritz Lang. This is not exactly a video essay or a review, it's more a brief overview of the film and its production and its history. I'm too old to do video essays, I think, I've, I've just not, I've got kids, I, I just, my brain died many years ago. So enjoy. Time for a speedy synopsis. Spoiler warning for this 97 year old film. Dr. Mabusa, psychoanalyst, hypnotist and arch villain causes chaos in 1920s Berlin by manipulating stock markets, counterfeiting money and arranging gambling rackets. Mabusa targets millionaire playboy Edgar Hull by hypnotising him to lose at cards, then hopes to have access to his fortune by setting him up with Cara Carosa, who not only works for Mabusa but is in love with him. The doctor's machinations comes to the attention of state prosecutor Von Wink, who tracks him through various casinos, meeting the beautiful but bored Count test told. Eventually, the detective comes face to face with Mabusa, but with unfavourable results. Hull is assassinated and Carosa gets arrested. Mabusa meets and is instantly smitten with the bored countess. He conspires to hypnotise her husband to cheat at cards, leading to his disgrace, and then Mabusa kidnaps the countess. Part 2. Count Told, devastated at being shamed as being a cheat and believing his wife has left him, seeks psychiatric help from Dr. Mabusa. Carosa commits suicide on Mabusa's orders. Then the doctor manipulates Count Told to take his life. Toll's death brings the mysterious psychiatrist to Von Wenk's attention. Power of suggestion, a disguise Mabusa convinces Wenk to drive off a cliff, however he's pulled to safety. The police surround Mabusa's hideout and a gunfight ensues. The distraught countess manages to get away as Mabusa escapes through the sewers which leads him to his secured counterfeiting workshop where he is trapped. The ghosts of his victims confront Mabusa and losing his grip on reality, Mabusa descends into madness. Dr. Mabusa first made an appearance in 1921 when journalist Norbert Jacques serialised his novel in the Berlin Illustrium. Jacques' intention was to shine a light on the hypocrisy, decadence and the sense of hopelessness many faced in the early days of the Weimar Republic. The story quickly came to the attention of rising director Fritz Lang and his relatively new writing partner Thea von Harbo. Within months of the story being printed, the trio of talent developed Jacques' pulpish social critique for the screen. The narrative would be divided into two features and were premiered one month apart. Strictly speaking, they are separate, but like Kill Bill, neither can stand alone and in this video I will be looking at part one and part two as a whole film. Part one had the title Der Große Spieler in Bildeszeit, which translates The Great Gambler, A Picture of Our Time, and part Part 2 Inferno in Spiel von Menschen und Server Zeit Inferno, a play about people of our time The film is very much a product of its time and place so much so that when it premiered in the USA a mere five years later it seemed so out of date and alien The 1922 programme for the film wrote Fritz Lang has set his sights on making not a blockbuster, not a detective story, not a mere film about society, but rather following the suggestion of the novel to forge a picture of the time in which the year of its creation is every bit as important a performer as the actors, the set, the designers, the photography. The world of this film is the world in which we live. Fritz Lang started to shoot Dr. Mibusa in November 1921, with the first part premiering in April 1922 and part two in the May. Germany was still suffering from the loss of the First World War and the various putsches throughout the country. Bitterness towards the new Weimar government grew by the day. There was an air of political illegitimacy regarding the Weimar government and the population felt a huge sense of betrayal after its leaders signed the Versailles Settlement, especially regarding Clause 231, the War Guilt Clause, which stated that Germans were responsible for the war and therefore had to pay reparation payments. This was a particular problem because during World War I, the Kaiser suspended the gold standard and funded the conflict through borrowing, figuring that they would pay the debt back when Germany won the war. Germany didn't win the war. Altogether, the German war debt was £8.5 billion. On top of that, the country had to pay out £6.5 in reparation payments. 
Germany was financially devastated by the war. Two million had died in the conflict. Six million were injured. The Spanish flu spread throughout Europe in 1918, so a huge portion of the workforce was gone. And on top of this, the government had to pay out war pensions. The population was devastated, as was the rest of Europe, but unlike Britain or France, they didn't even have the comfort of victory. So, the Weimar government printed more paper money without the economical resources to back it. While the mark was not strong, it remained stable until June 1921, when the Reparation Committee demanded Germany pay the payments in gold and foreign currency. To get this solid currency, Germany printed more money, which accelerated the deadline of the mark leading to inflation. The writing was on the wall for the country throughout the production of Dr. Mabusa, which started filming during what is historically referred to as the galloping inflation period. Several scenes in Dr. Mabusa visually parody the dire attempts to control the economy. Dr. Mabusa's counterfeit factory is run by blind men. Mabusa, disguised as an elderly businessman, writes a coded message on a real banknote, somewhat ironic considering he's printing fake money, then passes it on to one of his henchmen dressed as a beggar. This is not only a subtle way for criminals to communicate, but in reality people actually ended up using the paper currency to write on because it was cheaper to do that than buy a notepad. This is a period when people would move stacks of money around in wheelbarrows or use the worthless notes as wallpaper. The production of Mabusa was naturally hit by the financial turmoil. There are stories of set designers having to wander around Berlin streets, begging, stealing and borrowing nails to build the sets. Lang had to pay his workers daily as their wages would not be worth as much by the end of the week. Tia von Harbo had to cook hot meals on set to keep the entire unit fed and when she wasn't feeding them, she was knitting them jumpers. Even in the fictional world of Mabusa, Edgar Hull's debts rise from 30 marks in the book to 170,000 marks several months later on film. And in the 1923 edition of the book, a footnote was placed to inform the reader that Hull's debts should be in fact in the millions. This was the insanity of hyperinflation. The film was set in the Berlin of 1922. When Jean Renoir visited the German capital at this time, he commented that Sodom and Gomorrah was reborn there. This was an unstable period of languishing poverty, political uprisings and mass hunger. Yet this was a period of newfound wealth with a few individuals prospering from the war and the resulting inflation. While children begged on the street for food, the rich indulged in the affluent decadence Berlin had to offer. Sex clubs, drugs, gambling. Dr. Mabusa may have been a fictionalised crime lord propagating terror in a disordered society, yet Lang von Harbo and Jacques saw their country presided by criminals and corruption. There was a desired order in the chaos and it was such sentiments that would see the rise of the Nazis. Busa seeks sensation. He only finds satisfaction from committing crime and manipulating the weak, playing a game of life and death. He doesn't really differ from his victims. They all seem to revel in the sins that Berlin has to offer but are superficial, bored apathetic. Modern audiences may find themselves empathising with such characters as Edgar Hull and Count Told. However, to a contemporary German audience, these characters were not sympathetic. In fact, they partly represented what was wrong with their country. This frenzied decadence and tenacious striving for pleasure in casinos and dazzling nightclubs captured the attitudes of those who profited from either the war or inflation. And Lang brilliantly illustrates this in a brief digressive vignette about an hour into the movie where the narrative momentarily pauses and we are told the tale of Shram, the proprietor of one of the gambling dens. We see Shram rise from peddler to conflict, war profiteer to wealth and respected businessman. As Mabusa expert David Callet says, if this man is a success, maybe crime does pay. Hull is a good-for-nothing playboy, a man-child, a decadent selfish Bertie Wooster that throws daddy's money at chorus girls and at the gambling table. The Count is a weak-willed, oblivious, distant fragment from a bygone age. The listless Countess's only excitement is from witnessing people destroy themselves by getting into huge debts and seedy gambling joints. These characters represent the Weimar elite, wasting their money and lives. They are indifferent to the hunger and suffering throughout their nation. They lack the ability or inclination to improve the desperate plight of their fellow countrymen. The majority are self-centred and in a decadent city, in a broken country, where social dysfunction rules. It is inevitable that criminals such as Mabusa or the Nazis will take advantage.
As with the original Dr. Caligari script, there seemed to be a general distrust of authority in Dr. Mabusa, and it's hardly surprising. For many Germans, it was the upper classes such as Hull and the Tolds that had been responsible for the war. The Social Democratic Weimar government would probably want to see law and order take control. In the book, von Wink is more identifiable as the hero, however in the film he is much more watered down, and while he effectively fights Mabusa's hypnotic gaze and eventually figures out what's actually going on, he and the police are pretty ineffective in the whole. Mabusa's ultimate fate has been due to his self-destruction. He isn't brought down by the police. Now Lang would be critical of the ineffectiveness of law and order throughout his career. This lack of trust is perhaps an echo of how the majority of Germans saw the new Weimar government. Many of the solutions that were meant to ease the dilemmas that faced post-war Germany just seemed to create more obstacles. The country was deeply paranoid and insecure. Fritz Lang vaguely claimed he based Dr. Mabusa on Al Capone or just referred to him as a force of evil, a standard supervillain in the same mode as Phantomus or Doc Moriarty. Producer Eric Palmer claimed Mabusa and his machinations were based on the Spartists, whose violent uprising and destruction had played out on the Berlin streets a couple of years before. Some critics believe the creators of the film saw Mabusa's destruction of the stock market, counterfeiting and ruining the upper class as a solution to the many social and financial problems. The actor that played the title character, Rudolf Klein Roger, said that Mabusa is a symptom of a Europe that is falling apart, a guiding force, a creator of holy and destruction. He also said that he saw the character as a great revolutionist which suggests he may have admired the character to some extent, and some historians note the actor's real-life Nazi sympathies. The opening 20-minute sequence of the film, often cited as the best part by scholars, involves Mabusa's henchmen murdering a government official and stealing financial reports on a train and then using the information to manipulate the stock markets. Lang and Von Harbel got the inspiration for this sequence not from the novel, but from the 1913 French serial Phantomus, which shares more than a few similar similarities to Dr. Mabusa. However, in Mabusa, the opening sequence and the attack on the stock market would have been of more relevance to a German audience in 1922 than a pre-war French one. With the sudden drop of the market in 1921, Germany faced what historian Gerald D. Feldman calls an orgy of stock market speculation. The sophisticated opening sequence shows the doctor's interconnection with the randomness of the stock market. And it is clear here, this is all about control of information, manipulating lives and being the supreme master. In his book, The Great Disorder, historian Gerald D. Feldman calls 1922 the year of Dr. Mabusa. To him, the character of Mabusa was a genuine and conscious product of the inflation. Mabusa would have been emblematic of all that was wrong with the early Weimar Republic. The printing of money to combat inflation drove down the mark and made it as worthless as Mabusa's counterfeit notes. The stock market scam echoed the unpredictable instability of the exchange. Outbreaks of riots and violence are not spontaneous but planned. The images of Von Wink's men surrounding Mabusa's home laying siege would have invoked recent memories of the Spartists uprising in the Cap Pooch. Fritz Lang himself would write that he was inspired by a popular poster that circulated around Berlin at the time, which featured a skeleton dancing with a woman and the caption, Berlin you are dancing with death. Scholars of Lang have often found many personal comparisons between Dr. Mabusa and the director himself. Lang biographer Tom Gunning wrote, With Mabusa, Lang created not only his ultimate figure of urban crime, but his most complex enunciator figure, the author of his crimes, who aspires to be a demiurge in his own creation. Lang's own doppelganger, who haunted him for nearly the full extent of his career from 1922 to his last film in 1960. Lang's tyrannical nature was legendary. This reputation started early in his career. He was famously brutal towards his crew and actors. In this film, Lang fired live ammunition at his actors, so their terrified reactions are quite genuine. Lang was notorious for shooting scenes numerous times, so this terrifying experience went on for hours. 
Mabusa's main motivation in the film is to control the destinies of all that surround him. He is a player, a puppet master, a director and an author of circumstance. It is when Mabusa falls in love with Countess Todd's carefully controlled criminal empire crumbles. He finds a rival in his affection towards the Countess, not in her weak-willed husband but in Inspector Von Wenk, though this is much subtler in the film than it is in the original novel. This fictional ill-fated love triangle is actually pretty mundane, especially in comparison with what was going on behind the scenes. When Lang met his greatest collaborator and wife, Tia von Harbo, both were already married. Von Harbo had been married to Rudolf Klein Roger. The pair met while they were theatre actors in Munich and married in 1914 and then travelled to Berlin where von Harbo switched careers to concentrate full time on writing. Meanwhile, Klein Roger started his film career with a small but notable role as the thief in the cabinet of Dr. Caligari. Von Harbo met the young aspiring director Fritz Lang in 1920 were working as script collaborators on The Indian Tomb based on a novel by Thea von Harbo. Pair instantly formed a connection and moved on to work on further projects. Klein Roga would first collaborate with Lang in 1920 in The Wandering Shadow which was written by his wife. With the exception of Women in the Moon and Aim, Klein Roga would become a constant prominent presence in Lang's Weimar career. It's not clear when the affair between Lang and von Harbo began, but von Harbo's marriage to Rudolf Klein Roga was over by the time Dr. Mabusa was in production. The Chiel's relationship was evidently amicable enough to continuously work together throughout the following decade. I couldn't find any real information about how well Klein Roga and Lang got on off camera. While Lang was an outright sadist and brutal towards his actors, Klein Roga apparently just got on with it and tended to ignore him. In fact, von Harbo seemed to create specific roles for her ex-husband, even when Lang was not involved, and these range from a romantic tyrant in The Stone Rider to a tragic village idiot in Elizabeth and Donar, the latter of which was filmed after she and Lang had divorced and both von Harbo and Klein Roga were committed to the Third Reich. While the dissolution of Tia von Harbo's matrimonial union to Rudolf Klein Roga was peaceful, the ending of Fritz Lang's was the exact opposite. He had married Lisa Rosenthal in 1919 and she quickly became aware of his infidelity with von Harbo. The young couple were seen arguing in public and Lang apparently used to wave his browning revolver at Lisa. According to several sources at some point in 1920, Lisa walked into the Lang home and found her husband and von Harbo in a state of undress. Understandably, the woman flew into a rage and within hours she was dead in the bathtub with a gunshot wound to the chest. Both von Harbo and Lang claimed Lisa went into the bathroom and shot herself. Others quietly speculated that either the cheating husband or his lover murdered her. Now, people who knew Lang acknowledged he was a complete tyrant, but they didn't think he was capable of murder. However, it seems Lang managed to have the whole incident quietly covered up. His wife was buried before her family could reach Berlin, and there are no police records, an inquest, or even a death certificate in existence. Lang rarely mentioned the incident or even that he'd been married before von Harbo. The actuality of what happened has been lost in the century since. Did he feel remorse? Some film researchers point to the regular suicides that feature in his films or the characters that are haunted by the deaths they have caused. In total, Dr. Mabusa Jeshbula has three suicides. Cara Carosa, out of unrequited love. Count Told, out of shame. And George, Mabusa's henchman, out of a defiant loyalty. And then there is Mabusa, once trapped in a fortified vault of his own creation, ghosts of his victims come back to haunt him. When Von Wink breaks into the counterfeit factory, a haunted, vacant lunatic now inhabits Mabusa's body and he is carted away to the asylum. Dr. Mabusa the Gambler was considered an exciting and technological marvel when released in 1922. The first time Mabusa and Von Wenk meet, both in disguise, this sequence was universally praised for its animated glowing titles and this memorable, still striking shot as Mabusa attempts to hypnotise Von Wenk. In 1922, as much light was required as possible to process a film, so shooting night scenes was unthinkable. However, audiences applauded when they first saw the Mabusa car 
car chase. Critics were convinced that Lang had managed to achieve nighttime photography. However, Lang mostly achieved these effects indoors in a controlled studio, and the few outdoor shots they did get were from filming right beside the studio where they had the ability to use red lights to illuminate the scene. To further make this scene more realistic and urban, a model train was superimposed onto this shot, which is still effective and convinces the viewer. The film's modernity was a huge change for its German audience. Most German films were set in the historical past or in a Germanic fantasy realm, but Mabusa was set very much in its time. Lang uses modern technology constantly to tell his story. Clocks, trains, cars, the telephone. The villain uses these modern tools to achieve his ultimate goal of domination. Lang uses modern technology to synchronise space and time through the use of parallel editing. In Russia, a young Sergei Eisenstein was commissioned to re-edit the film for a Soviet audience. According to some sources, he didn't need to cut much as the film was perfect. And in another more realistic version of the story, the film was edited down to suit the political restrictions of the USSR. Though Eisenstein learnt much through the film and this would aid him in his theories and practice of montage later in his own career. Psychiatry was part of this modernity, but is viewed as a suspicious new craze. Dr. Mabusa is a distant cousin of Dr. Caligari, and like its predecessor, this film demonstrates the contemporary perception of psychiatry, and this impact influenced the way the media would view the profession for decades to come. Post-World War I was a fruitful period for psychoanalysis. Freud's theories and methods were increasingly discussed, and he was paying particular attention to PTS and questions of leadership after the war. French neurologist Jean-Martin Charcot was one of Freud's main and he was known to publicly display patients with curious symptoms and hypnotise them. Hypnosis was also being employed to help the shell shot from the trenches, yet there was always a great caution regarding hypnosis. In the early part of the century there were many studies that investigated how suggestive a subject could become under hypnosis. And Dr Mabusa Deshbula, in its pompish fun way asks a similar question. Over the years, the film has been viewed and described as one of the great German expressionist films. However, this isn't quite the case. While Lang often used expressionist techniques, he considered it too arbitrary a label for such an eclectic director. There is some disdain towards the movement. To further demonstrate Count Toll's moral decay, he's a proud collector of modern art, specifically expressionist art. While asked by the Count what he thinks about expressionism, Mabusa answers, Expressionism is just a game, but why not? Everything is a game these days. So, this film is nearly four and a half hours long. And it is split into two parts. But having said that, it's still a bit of a slog. On first viewing. Now, I have to admit, the first couple of times I sat down to watch this, I drifted off after the first 20 minutes. But I'm 40, I've got three kids, I'm permanently, it doesn't take much for me to drift off. The soundtrack really didn't help. So you really have to be in the right frame of mind to watch this. And when I did manage to get through it, I did enjoy it as a whole. However, if you're the casual silent cinema fan or even a first time viewer, this film is probably going to be a bit too much for you. There's, it, it does have a pacing issue. It does, it is slow in parts. And I know um, it has been edited down and it's the worst thing to say, chop out bits. But if you had a skilled editor, it could have been tighter. There's, the intertitles are far too long. As the narrative moves along, the pace does pick up, but I think this film really works if you have a basic knowledge of the Weimar history. I would also think it helps when Dussy Told comes into the film and creates that dynamic between Mabusa and Von Wenk. Certain shots and scenes still stand out. The final shootout is still exciting and we can really see the influence that it gave to Hitchcock in The Man Who Knew Too Much and Carol Reed in the third man. The histrionic acting of silent cinema, specifically German silent cinema, is on show here but I don't feel it's as overbearing as other films. 
Rudolf Klein Roga has drawn mixed reviews over the years. Some people think he is over the top and his distinctive physical appearance meant he was unbelievable as a master of disguise. Personally, I think he does quite a good job. He is a charismatic villain and he holds my attention throughout. He has a few moments when he's chewing the scenery, but they are in keeping with the character. And in Germany at this time, pantomime was hugely popular. And with Klein Roga, I feel it's in keeping with the film and frankly, it's not as obnoxious as other actors' performances were at the time. Some of the makeup is hilarious, even when Mabusa is himself. It varies from shot to shot. But I think Klein Roga effectively alters his mannerism and personality with each disguise. While I think the ending is impressive, Mabusa's sudden guilt about the deaths he's responsible for comes from nowhere. He's been so cold and merciless throughout the whole four and a half hour film and this sudden switch just just seems so out of character there is a supernatural element to the sequel and it's possible that's what's happening here but it's not very clear even his hypnotic powers are a bit confusing as his eyes can control people at a distance or when their backs are towards him and i think this removes the film from the documentary style realism that it's striving for and it almost becomes a comic book version of reality mabusa would be at home in Gotham. So, if you made it this far, thank you. I really appreciate you listening to my rambling. I am quite new to this, so I'd really appreciate any comments or any feedback you could offer. Um, this is the first time I've sat in front of a camera, so <laughs> sorry. Also, it would do a, me a huge favour if you could possibly press the like button or subscribe. I think it's down here somewhere. So thank you for watching this video. I'm hoping to make more videos for October as it is the month of Halloween. Uh, I'm hoping to do some sort of Nosferatu video, but everyone's done a Nosferatu video, so I'm not really sure where I can go with that. Um, but um, thank you for watching if you're still here. I really appreciate it. Uh, and I hope to see you next time.